No. Suppose now I, I, somebody gave you a play written by Schiller, Heine, Goethe, Marlowe, or anybody. The way you approach it, because you've been brought up in the schools in this country, in the Northeast, you'll, you'll buy the book and go straight to the play and hope to get an idea of the play from the words spoken by the actors. That's what you do, because you're empiricist. See? What you do is, you get to know about the play. You have to learn the events which the play going to describe, is going to describe, and the history of the actual writing of the play. Those are the two things you've got to know before you start to read. Because you'll miss the whole you, you, you miss the whole thing. The events of which the, play, of which the play is concerned and the history of the actual writing of the play. What pressure he had. He writing in jail. Was he in the Bastille? You know? Was he released by Castro and came in a boat? Whatever. Whatever the, the, the history of the play is. It's very good to know it before you start reading the play. It makes... I found that the problem with the local and Shakespeare is that people don't know the universal history behind the plays and uh, we're, never, we're just told to read it. And as you go along and you meet a problem, you explain it. Okay? Which is the way we fight wars, I suppose, if we through. Hope for the best. Shakespeare never staged a play which the audience didn't know the story of. Every play he staged they knew the story. If the story wasn't as popular as other stories, advanced publicity told you what the storyline was. His reason was simple. He didn't want you to go to his plays to pick up the storyline, what happens next. Who is going to screw who? Who is going to kill whom? You know, if that's the level you're at, well then you can't form my points. Still who wants to so popular. Uh -huh. Will Luke marry Jane or will uh, the, uh, the shadow and the jewelry or whatever it means. You know. And this is no exception. There was a <coughs> book came out in 1603, a chronicle history of King Lear. Lear was a king of Britain. And in 1603, a book came out, a chronicle history of King Lear. And was read by those who could read. One of the fantastic things about the Elizabethan era, which I think was the best, <coughs> the most important era, I think, in, in British history, sorry, you know, I think it's Elizabethan, not the Victorian. You know, you were decadent by them. It's how many people could read. Do you know the settlers left at this time to come over here? You ever stop to ask yourself, what kind of people the settlers in America were who came in from 1600 onwards? That you could move them by writing pamphlets? You gotta be literate. Have you read Thomas Paine? And that moved people? You couldn't move good in Europe with Thomas Paine or an updated version of Thomas Paine. And they can't even read. We have this stupid concept of functional literacy. You know it. All it means is you can take the cocaine and you can screw. That's what it means. That's what a functional literate does. You know, I, I taught them at Rutgers. It was a very literate population that we had here. School in the Bible, Milton, and Shakespeare. That's the basis of their education. Now it'll be 200 years later. People think Shakespeare's name a band. Yeah, there are people who believe that, that Shakespeare, what band is that? The one from Alabama? <laughs> so, this play was, this book came out in 1603. Stop it. Secondly, there's another book that came out. 1605, the book came out. In 1603, what came out was a book by Hasnet. Now, you guys never had to study compiled religion, so you don't know it. Name has that wrote a book of popish impostures. An imposture means a 
assembly line, you know, see deception. And popishing passes means Roman Catholic popes deception. And in this book, he's really stating the Puritan and Protestant. You see, Puritan comes from purifying. And the idea is to purify the Catholic religion. Get all the, the idea was, never, never called it, get rid of all the cult trappings and high mass and incense and all that weird smell, you know, and giving wine and giving bits and pieces of potato chips and saying it's the body and the soul of Christ and all that. You know. They want to purify it. Above all, to get rid of all those deacons and archbishops. You know, what happened? Religion never had that, you know. The Roman religion had that. Roman mystery religion, the Pontifex Maximus, had a sort of feudal system. The Pontifex at the top, and who is the second in command, and then you go down, you see? And what Constantine did was to take that system and put it in the Christian religion, so you can control it. Hence, when you turn out here, Archbishop O'Connor, then Bishop somebody in Philadelphia, and Bishop somebody in Boston, and that idiot in New York, you know, then underneath them you have, I don't know, deacons, I don't even know the Catholic hierarchy anymore. But that's what people run as a feudal system. So, from this book on Pope by Hasnett, the Popish Imposture, Shakespeare got all this business of uh, Edmund. Bastardy and the themes that he saw. There was also a hospital famous at the time in London called the Hospital of St. Bartholomew. Ah, you were there. Did you have your shelling? No? Of course. Hospital of St. Bartholomew, which is a hospital for the insane in London at the time. And the Cockneys, people live in London called Cockneys, right? They speak a funny way. So I might, whom, whom last, and I might, throw so who's panic, you know. Call blind. Well, they contracted St. Bartholomew to bedlam. That's the origin of the word bedlam. Mm -hmm. It means at an insane place or an insane person. It's Bartholomew contracted in Old English. See? So when you use the word, it's all bedlam in here. There really is some this time from St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. And Tom of Bedlam was a lunatic. And Bedlam is a mad house in the same side. That's the original meaning. Words change later on, you know. But that's the origin of Bedlam. Madness. Confusion. Right? Tower of Babel situation. So the, 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 the hence. What Shakespeare is going to do is he's going to incorporate madness as a theme. <coughs> he's going to also to deal with filial piety. It's a long Latin phrase meaning duties owed by children to parents. Now, what? Henry the Seventh, as you know by now, beat up Richard the Third and took the throne in 1485. And he had two sons, Arthur and Henry. Arthur was the elder of the two. He arranged the marriage in those days, it's not it now. You meet a girl, you eye her off, and she eyes you up, and you ring her mother and what have you. used to arrange marriages. It used to work. My eyes are called an answer. It used to work. Not like you guys leaving tomorrow morning. You know, honor and duty was involved, right? I often believe that's how I got married looking back on it. <laughs> they set me up, I didn't know. <laughs> anyway, the thing is, Arthur died because he, he was primogenitor, mean the eldest son's rule. And the eldest son died. Henry the seventh's eldest son died. And his younger son, Henry VIII, not only will take the throne, but took the man's bride. He married Catherine of Aragon, Aragon, the province of Spain. It's an arranged marriage. And she gave him two children, Edward and Mary. And she brought them up to the Catholics. They were ambivalent. She taught them Catholicism, and the king taught them Protestantism. <laughs> See? So they have a put in each camp. Elizabeth is the youngest of the three, and she is the daughter of Anne of a thousand days. 
Anyway, so well, this Henry VIII was a clever character. He defended the Catholic religion once. I told you this before. In such a way that the Pope gave him the title "Filii Defensor." And you find the English coins "Fid Def," the defender of the faith. Who, when he wanted to divorce, in those days he wanted to divorce the Pope that he knew something. There's a fiction they used to use. You should give you knowledge, you say you never was married. Some error, some defect existed at the time of marriage, not conservation, whatever. And uh, you couldn't get married. Anyway, the Pope refused to exercise it. Hey, this is man married to a Spanish lady, Aragon. And Castile, and Aragon in the big provinces in Spain. Olé, stop. Big, you know, Catherine of Aragon. So Henry said, well, Cranmer and Lord and those guys are saying, look, let this damn Catholic stupid, you do your Protestant thing. So he jumped on the bandwagon. His motives, of course, had nothing to do with high theology. He was railroaded to becoming, to leading the Protestant revolution in Britain because he wanted a divorce. The rebel, others were serious in a doctrinal way. Anyway, he got rid of Catherine of Aragon. He married Anne Bolin, and she gave him Elizabeth. That's the point. That's the point. Edward the sixth. Primogeniture means sons first. Primus, Janet, the born, the born, who's born first, first son. So when he died in 1547, the son, Edward the sixth, the Pope. But he was consumptive and weak. And um, he didn't have a chance to implant Catholicism. But a lot of Puritans left and went to Holland. They had a big movement. When the Catholics or semi Catholics were in of Britain, the radical Puritans would go to Holland. When the Puritans the Cromwell's time would take over, the Catholics would go to France. <laughs> so, you'll incidentally you make no later on that uh, when Cromwell came to this power, Hobbes, who's royalist, he went to the continent, to France. And when the king came back with Charles II, Locke went to Holland. You know, Locke was a Puritan. Anyway, the point is, this is the background to this play. Thesis. If you have order and harmony, and if power is transferred to the wicked, the morally diseased, the irrational, if power is transferred to them, you get chaos. Succession is an important aspect of power. Who succeeds? It must be known on what principle succession will happen and who will succeed, and that person should be trained as a kind of philosopher. If you don't have that, you have capriciousness and whimsy, foibles and idiosyncrasies, and you know, you get this kind of event. This kind of event. Because Mary took over from Edward the Sixth. 1547, 1553, Edward VI. 1553, 58, Mary. Catholic. And then she died. Great day, Elizabeth took over. And that's, we have all this Renaissance and the big Yamada in 1588, 30 years after that. And Shakespeare was born in 1564, Marlowe is around her. Huh? And all the great events happened during her reign. Dudley of Leicester is her man. Later on, it will be Essex. You know, it's a great time. And she's the prophet. She's good. And when she dies, and they bring this music from Scotland, this man who believes in demonology, James VI of Scotland, 
son of Mary Queen of Scots. His father was a Yorkshire Catholic named Dan Lee. When they bring him, the Puritans said to hell with this, we ain't sticking around. <laughs> you know, and next thing you know, people are going, looking for Virginia, but ending up in a um, Massachusetts. Plymouth Rock. They left. That's one of the impetus, one of the, the, the reasons that they left. Because this Catholic guy who's going to pretend, he believes in the divine right of kings. He believes that God chose him to rule. You can't do a thing about it. No consent of the government. He's chosen by God, direct descendant of Adam, to rule mankind. And to, 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 if necessary, accommodate the Catholic religion. And he trains his son in that. And his son, Charles, you know, eventually lost his head, literally. <laughs> Cut off his head. head. So, <coughs> this play is about that. This play. King Lear, an old British king, before the Norman Conquest, the Norman Conquest is 1066. It's long before that. At the time when Britain was not Christian, before Christianity happened to Britain. Don't forget, Caesar's 55 BC. St. Patrick London into Ireland much, much longer later than that. Hmm? He's a pagan, and this plays about paganism and infidels and pagans. And you'll find Apollo and Jupiter and Hecate and references that kind of thing in the play. The British king. Not, not some more. <laughs> it's an English king. I always wondered if there wasn't some joke by Shakespeare in this eldest girl, Goneril. Of course, I have a different understanding of the word Goneril than you guys. <laughs> used to always, I never understood that. It really is telling us something. Yeah. The thing is, there decided that he's going to make a gift into virus of power. Normally power descends on death. Okay? But you can give a gift into virus. It happens today if you want to escape estate duty and estate taxes. Suppose I'm a rich man. And you guys are my children. And I feel like I'm going to die in four or five. I give you all gifts into virus now. So when I die, I have very little to pay a state duty on. The government gets nothing at all. Very little. Problem is, how are you going to behave if I make out right gifts to you? See, this is an important thing. I tell you one, one legal fact I know. In Britain, the owner of land could not, the word is alienate. It means, it means transfer land. Couldn't alienate land, give away land. Right until 1873, adjudicature act. You couldn't alienate land. So if I own land and I have a son, he knows he must get it. He's the heir. So he'll abuse me and he'll raise money. It's called a futurity. You know, you go to money lender, give me a couple of bucks, I'll inherit someday, you know. And you can do nothing because you can't dispossess him. And you can't give away the land to somebody else by will. They give chattels to the person that you saw the old days. And when the American Revolution occurred, the first thing they did was to make sure that in America you could give away land by will. You see? It wasn't until 1837 that the first move was made in Britain by a thing called, and don't, I'm not being funny, called the Wills Act. With me. <laughs> it means about will, it's testament, 1837. This made a partial attempt to allow him to give away land by will in 1873. As they do now, they can say, Hi, I don't give you my land, I give a home for the cats and dogs. Well, and they do <laughs> give cats and dogs now. <laughs> the thing I'm, I'm trying to get at is. People used to give power away into virus. But you, you couldn't give land like that. Primogeniture meant 
eldest son. If he dies, next son. If there are no sons, sisters and co parsony equally. But you must take account of all sisters. They don't have the same strict rules of guilt as they have. <laughs> what does this guy do? He divides his kingdom, the Anglo Saxon kingdom, before the Normans come in. See, the Normans brought in primogeniture in 1066. They brought in because it's a Germanic tradition. In Brittany, Normandy. He's, he says, Look, you three girls come here. I'm going to give you the crown. I keep the crown. I'll remain king. But I'm going to divide my realm into three and give each of you your men. You married Goneril, you married Albany, and Regan, not to do it down Regan, you married Cornwall. And Cordelia, you got two men, you lucky, you got the Duke of Burgundy and the King of France. You got a royal clutch, eh? <laughs> You have this and uh but I'm dividing up the thing. But I want you to tell me how much you love. But the, part, the first thing is, that's an invitation for manipulation. And you've got to remember this. There are many people out there who will tell you what you want to hear. They're the most dangerous people in the world. They know what you want to hear, and they will tell you that. You put on your, your, your new blue dress that you bought at 42nd Street or 5th Avenue or someplace, and spent a few bucks on. How do I look? You look beautiful. Perhaps you look stupid and ugly, but I won't tell you that. <laughs> you know? Or you, you're at a party, you're dancing with a girl, and you're hungry. And you think that you're going to have a bargain in your refrigerator when you get home and a bear. And she says, Daddy, what are you thinking of? I'm thinking about your eyes. <laughs> tell her what she wants to hear. <laughs> you will always find people who will tell you what you want to hear. Now, I crack a few jokes about it. 